today we're going to start talking about our, our final topic, um, which is going to be uh, data centers, virtualization, and cloud computing. Um, so this is going to be sort of a nice follow-up to some of the distributed systems uh, stuff we talked about. Um, so first we're going to talk about you know, what is a data center. Um, it's probably a term many of you have, have heard at some point, but we'll talk about you know, what a typical data center actually entails. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, virtualization, which is one, which is a uh, important sort of OS technology you should be aware of, but it's also a particular use in data centers, and we'll talk about how that's done. Um, and then we'll talk about cloud computing, which is sort of a very general term, but refers very much to the use of data centers and virtualization, and we'll talk about how all of these terms are, are, are kind of tied together. So let's start by uh, talking about you know, what is a data center. Right, so a data center is basically a big giant warehouse of computing resources. Right, so you know, a, a the typical picture of a data center is this big, huge building which has huge numbers of you know servers, um, you know CPU cores, um, disk arrays, right, just lots of computing resources all packed into you know the same location, um, and you know data centers are used by typically, you know, big companies to run very, very large distributed applications, right? So a company like Google, which, you know, is running a whole wide variety of products, right? Obviously, Google search is their sort of most high profile, right? But they are servicing, you know, thousands or, you know, tens of thousands of users all at the same time, right? Constantly. So they have massive computing resource needs. And so the way they handle those needs is by running their applications in data centers. So Google has, Google owns a bunch of data centers that are distributed all over the world and you know, each of those data centers can have you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines in them, right? So huge amounts of you know, processing power all, all located together. Um, and you know, pretty much all the big tech names, you know, all the big tech companies you know, like Google and Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, right? all these big companies extensively use data centers to run their you know, massively distributed applications. Um, so you know, examples of concrete applications that are run in data centers, right? Google search is obviously one. Um, Amazon, for example, is another big example. Amazon is a big player in data centers. Um, so you know, Amazon runs their you know, online shopping store and a wide variety of other things in data centers. Um, something like Netflix, right? Netflix is a very common you know, user-facing application. That's another example of something that's run out of a data center, right? So when you go to Netflix.com and you're streaming video, that video is being streamed to you from some data center located somewhere, right? In among you know tens of thousands of, of other machines. Right. So so lots lots of different examples. Um, so now let's take a look at you know what what is a data center actually inside? You know, what what does a data center look like? All right. So this picture here shows an actual interior of a data center. Right. So you can envision this basically you know, as I said, a giant warehouse of of servers. Right. So it's you know it, it sort of the picture is sort of take something like Costco and replace all of the you know merchandise with servers stacked on shelves, and that's kind of your picture of a data center. Right. You've got aisles and you've got these huge racks. And all of the racks are just filled with computing equipment, right? So you have you know, racks of actual servers that are you know, performing computation, right? You have storage arrays, um, you have infrastructure to support you know, networking, network switches, right? Because you have all these you know, tens of thousands of servers, they're obviously all networked together, right? So you obviously have infrastructure there. Um, and then there's a lot of related infrastructure that's needed to basically just keep all of this stuff running. Right, so you can put all these servers together, um, but then there's a lot of related stuff that you sort of need in the physical environment. Right, so for example, right, cooling is a big issue when you have all of these many servers together. Right, I mean, when you go and buy you know, a desktop computer, right, your computer typically comes with you know, maybe a couple of fans for cooling, and that's pretty much it. But things are a little bit more complicated when you have racks of thousands of machines all jammed into a very tight space. Right, that generates a very significant amount of heat. And so in order to handle all of that heat, cooling infrastructure is actually a, a significant component of a, a, of a typical data center. Um, also, you know, in order to just use all the, in order to provide all the power necessary to run all this equipment, right, that's substantial as well. 
you know, both for something like cooling equipment, right? If you are running a bunch of air conditioning units to cool your data center, right, that's going to use a lot of electricity. And then, of course, the computing equipment itself will also use a lot of power, right? And then you'll need things like backup generators, right? Because when we're running these massive distributed applications, right, reliability is also another thing that is really of high importance. So in order to provide that, right, we need things like backup generators in case, uh, you know, in case the, the main power connection to the grid goes down. So, you know, as I said, data centers are, are located all over the world. Um, Actually, we also have a data center that's fairly local here. Um, so we, there's a uh, data center that's located down in Holyoke um, that was actually built in conjunction with UMass um, called uh, the Massachusetts Green High Performing uh, Computing Center. Um, and so this, that shows that that's an actual picture of the data center down in Holyoke. Um, this is not a particularly large one, but it is still, you know, you can see that's still a, a fairly sizable building. Um, and so, you know, these just shows a couple of pictures of the interior of, of the data center, um, right? So, for example, you know, down here on the left and on the right, there are, those are basically cooling pipes that are basically pumping air in order to cool the equipment inside the data center. Um, this is a, you know, picture of these are actually some of the machine racks, right, that are actually filled up with, with servers. Um, now, uh, one, inter one interesting question to ask is, well, what, what actually determines where we set up our data centers? Like, why would we actually set up a data center, you know, in Holyoke? Um, so, based on what I've said, what might make somewhere a good site for a data center? Yeah. Uh, cheap, uh, cheap real estate. Yeah, that's a really good one, right? Because if you want to build these huge buildings, right, and as I said, this is a fairly small one, but really <laughs> big data centers can be the size of your multiple football fields. Right, so really, really big buildings. So cheap real estate is one important consideration. What else? Yeah. Cheap electricity. Yeah, that's the, the other big one, right? Because we're using all of this, you know, we'll, we'll see in a little bit, I'll show some graphs, but essentially, you know, the actual cost of the power is a major consideration in the total cost of actually running the data center. And Holyoke actually has very, very cheap power in large part due to the fact that there are hydro facilities down there generating power off the river, right? So Holyoke actually has very cheap power, which is another reason why it's, it's been a, you know, a good site for, for building a data center, right? Because, you know, let's say you might have a typical server that takes, you know, maybe a kilowatt of electricity, then, you know, scale that up to a couple of thousand servers. And um, I think the, the MGH PCC uses something like 10 megawatts of power, but that's, you know, again, fairly small. Very large data centers may use as much electricity as, you know, maybe even a small city. Um, so, uh, now, you know, I, the, the, the G in that stands for green, right? And that obviously refers to essentially the energy efficiency of the facility, right? So, obviously, if your facility is using a ton of electricity, then obviously using less electricity is a significant, you know, that, that's a significant benefit if you can achieve that. Um, so, for example, one of the ways that the data center in Holyoke is comparatively green is that oftentimes, in order to cool the servers, rather than running a ton of air conditioners, it actually just pumps in air from outside, right? Because if, if outside air is cooler than air inside the data center, then you can essentially cool your machine just by pumping in air from the outside rather than running air conditioners, right? And so that's actually what a lot of these pipes are doing. They're basically just, you know, pumping in a ton of air. Right, and so the you know the, the data center is also green in the sense that it's using you know power from green sources, right? It's using <laughs> hydropower, right, which is very clean. So that's that's another way. Yeah. Uh, do you only have, is there no, there are air conditioner. You know, there are chiller <laughs> units as well, um, which use a lot of power, but they're there but left idle whenever possible, right? So obviously, if it's you know if it's a really hot day in the summer and the exterior air is very hot, then obviously you will potentially run those air conditioners. But whenever possible, we can leave them off. Obviously, around here, you know, the climate is, is relatively cool most of the time. So, uh, you know, we can, we can leave those off a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, also just to give you a sense of the importance of power usage in all this, you know, as a general rule in a data center type environment, um, for, you know, every dollar you spend on electricity to actually run the servers, which is significant, right, because servers, when you have tons of them, use a lot of power, you're typically spending another dollar on energy just to cool the servers, 
right? So, you know, power is very important, and also a significant component of that is just power spent cooling the servers. Now, you know, but all this is still, you know, very expensive. Um, so, uh, the MGH PCC costs about $80 million to build, right? And that's essentially just for the infrastructure. That's not for the actual servers in it. Um, so, right now, the, the data center, I think it's, uh, this may be a little outdated, but I think it's something like 40% full, meaning that 40% of its machine capacity is actually taken up by servers. And that's obviously constantly growing as machines are deployed. But just the actual infrastructure of the data center you know, is very, very expensive. So one essentially alternate approach to actually go about building these data centers is essentially a modular approach. So the idea here is that rather than going and sort of upfront designing and constructing this really massive, expensive warehouse building, you can basically just get these modular containers that are basically off-the-shelf building blocks for a data center. Right? So the idea is that you get maybe one of these you know, shipping containers that's maybe 40 feet across. And it essentially comes to you stocked with servers and sort of all of the other equipment built in. And all you basically need to do is take that and plug it in to provide electricity and obviously you know, hook it up to a network and so forth. And then that basically gives you an easy way to sort of build up a data center out of these you know, modular components. Right? So that is an easier way to sort of scale up your data center. Right? If you want to add more machines, you can just go out and buy more of these modules rather than you know, if you are building a huge warehouse and your warehouse fills up, right, there's not sort of an easy way to extend that once you've reached your maximum capacity. Right? But as we just saw, even for a relatively modest data center, it's still you know, very intensive and expensive to build one of these, one of these data centers. So you know, that sort of gives us a, a little introduction of what a data center actually is. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what some of the technology is that actually goes into, some of the software technology that actually goes into building data centers. So you know, one of the main techniques that's used in data centers is, is called virtualization. And this is not just applicable to data centers, but it's, it's very much used there. So essentially at a high level, virtualization just means we are going to take some machine interface and use it to mimic the behavior of some other system, right? Some other interface, right? And so one easy, one easy example of this is essentially providing some other operating system on top of some underlying operating system, right? Because one of the ways we've talked about operating systems is essentially providing some interface for programs, right? You're running an operating system and it's providing an interface and programs written to run on your operating system are using that interface. So virtualization is where we're basically going to you know, uh, mimic another interface on top of the same underlying hardware. So um, this was actually introduced quite a while back by IBM in the 1970s. Um, and it was introduced because of the issue that you know, back then, you know, mainframes were the big thing, right? So when people bought machines, they bought these you know, million dollar mainframe computers. And you know, computing equipment, the hardware was changing very frequently. Right? So every so often a new mainframe would come out and it would have you know, a more advanced architecture, it might support you know, new operations. And the problem there was that in general then you would not have backwards compatibility with all the software you had running on your old mainframe. Right? So you'd get new features, the hardware would support more things, but all of your old software written to run on it would not actually work anymore. Right, you'd have to you know, go and essentially port all of your software to run on your new system. Right? And that's not very good when you are spending all of this money on new hardware and then you're having to you know, redo all of your software. Right? So IBM came up with this idea of virtualization to say basically we can give you the new hardware and then we're basically going to give you this virtualization layer that's going to essentially you know, simulate the behavior of the old system. Right? And then you can run all of your same software on the new system just through that simulation layer. And that simulation layer is basically going to make it look to your application like it's actually running on the old type of hardware, right? regardless of what the actual underlying hardware is. Right? So you know, as some simple example, you know, maybe we have here on the right, we have you know, maybe some, some type of CPU, you know, CPU A. And that has some you know, interface that programs can use, right? Interface A. 
And then, you know, we go out and buy some new system that has some new CPU with different features, right, CPU B, right? And so then we're just going to add this layer, you know, on top of interface B, right? The, the uh, you know, the uh, simulation layer obviously has to know how to use the new hardware. But that simulation layer is then going to present the same interface A on which we can run all of the same programs, right? And then we don't need to modify anything because they are going to run using the exact same interface that they did before, but we'll still get, you know, the efficiency benefits or whatnot, whatever the benefits are of, of running on the new system. So, you know, that was essentially the old, you know, the old use for virtualization was basically pro providing this backward compatibility for legacy software. Um, but virtualization is also used quite a bit today, um, largely for other uses. Um, so I don't know, have any of you actually used virtualization products? Yeah, so a couple of you. Right, so one popular use of virtualization today is basically running multiple operating systems on your single machine. Right, so your machine might be running Windows or your machine might be running Linux, but basically using virtualization, you can actually run different operating systems on top of your base machine. Right, and you can potentially run multiple operating systems all at the same time on your machine. Right, and this is basically the idea of, of virtual machines. Right, where you can basically run multiple virtual machines on your system, where those are essentially you know, mimicked interfaces running on some underlying hardware, but you can run whatever software is expecting that simulated interface, you know, regardless of what the underlying hardware looks like. So, you know, essentially there's, there's a number of different levels at which we can actually you know, go and mimic whatever the, whatever the interface we want is. Um, so one way is to actually mimic the behavior of the hardware itself, right? Because the hardware itself is, you know, handling assembly instructions and it knows how to execute, you know, given assembly instructions, right? So one thing we can do is we can basically just directly emulate the CPU instruction set of the underlying hardware in order to prevent, in order to present, you know, some other interface that some other system is, is expecting, right? So a good example of this um, is, is a, something like virtual PC which is a, something that's not really used nowadays, but a couple of years back, right, Mac, Mac uh, computers ran on the PowerPC architecture, whereas Windows ran on the Intel x86 architecture, right, completely separate, right? PowerPC was not, you know, Intel and had a completely different instruction set. But we often have the case where, you know, I might be running a Mac, but I want to be able to run Windows software. So you can essentially go out and get this virtual PC product which is basically going to just emulate the x86 assembly instructions that, you know, your software is expecting, right? So then I can just run some Windows software and it's issuing x86 instruction, you know, assembly instructions. Those are just going to be passed to virtual PC, which is going to take all of those instructions, translate them into some powered PC instructions, and that will actually allow you to, you know, run your software written for some entirely different architecture. Um, now, that's not really needed today because both Macs and PCs today are running on the x86 architecture. Um, but that was, you know, that, that's sort of one approach. Um, but we can also do virtualization at, you know, a higher level. Um, so, for example, something like Wine, which some of you may have used before. So Wine is basically this program that you can run on Linux, which basically allows you to run Windows applications on a Linux machine. And that's not presenting you some other hardware architecture. Basically what Wine is, is it's actually implementing the Win32 API, which is one of the main, you know, the main API used by Windows applications, and is basically just implementing the Win32 API in Linux. Right, so when you're running Wine, you can basically run an application, a Windows application through Wine, right, and a Windows application is expecting the interface of Windows, you know, the Win32 API, and if you have provided that, you know, if you provided the same interface through Wine, then you can still run your Windows applications, right? So that's, you know, doing the, doing the translation at a different level, but still essentially providing the same end effect of being able to mimic some other useful interface that programs are expecting. Um, and, you know, another type of virtualization that you all have used is Java. Right, because when we talk about Java, we talk about running our applications on the JVM, right, the Java virtual machine, right, and that's basically just another way of doing this, right, because Java programs are basically expecting the standard Java API, 
And regardless of what the underlying hardware is, right, in general, the same Java program is going to run regardless of whatever the underlying hardware is because you're always running it on top of the JVM, right, the Java Virtual Machine. And that's actually doing the heavy lifting of translating your Java program into whatever, you know, commands that the underlying, you know, the underlying machine actually knows how to interpret. Right, so that's, that's, that's another example of essentially, you know, uh, application level virtualization. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of different ways that we can, we can actually do this. Now, there's essentially two different types of OS level virtualization. Um, and they have the very helpful names, type 1 and type 2. So, uh, basically when we're talking about virtualization, the sort of that extra layer we're talking about that is essentially providing the translation, that's called the hypervisor, right? So in these kinds of virtualization approaches, essentially the main piece of software is the hypervisor, right? So type two is the type of uh, virtualization that you will actually typically run on your desktop, right? So if you're running some application like VMware that actually lets you run some other OS on top of your machine, that's basically a type two hypervisor where your machine is still running some host operating system, right? So like my machine is running Mac OS, maybe your machine is running Windows. And then you basically run this type 2 hypervisor on top of the, you know, on top of your regular machine, right? And that looks just like a regular application, right? So you can go out and buy, you know, VMware for your machine and that's just like a regular application, right? So you start running VMware in whatever OS your machine is running. And then that hypervisor then allows you to run, you know, guest OSs on top of it, right? And those guest OSs do not need to be the same as the host operating system. Um, so I'll show you a demo in a second, but, you know, I can take my Mac and essentially run a guest OS that's actually running Windows, right? And there's just going to be that, you know, uh, hypervisor layer in between, right? So that's what a type 2 hypervisor is, where you have this host operating system and the hypervisor on top of it. Right, and that hypervisor is running alongside whatever processes your machine is running that are just, you know, regular processes running on, running on your machine. Um, and then a type 1 hypervisor is where we're essentially running the hypervisor directly on the machine itself. Right, there's essentially no intermediary host operating system. Right, so in that context, basically when you're booting up, you're not booting up your regular OS, right, you're not booting up Mac OS or Windows, you're essentially just booting up your hypervisor, right, that, that one translation layer, and then on top of that, you're running your actual guest OSs in which you will run whatever applications you want, right? And again, one of the very nice things here is that you can potentially run multiple virtual machines on top of a single physical machine, right? Because like in this example, we have, you know, we have one physical machine running this hypervisor, and then we have maybe two virtual machines running on top of it. Right, and one of them might be running Windows, one of them might be running Linux, and each one of those is running, you know, Windows and, and Linux applications. Right, but in, you know, in both cases, right, the virtual machines are just running essentially, you know, the off-the-shelf software, right, Windows or Linux and whatever, you know, software has been written for them. And inside the virtual machine, it looks just like you're running on real hardware. Right, there's essentially no notion that actually this is essentially just a virtualized machine. It's not running directly on you know, physical hardware. Um, and you know, to give you an example of you know, why this sort of thing might be useful, right, let's consider maybe you have a really powerful machine that has you know, eight processing cores. And you want to run some application on it, but the application is only going to take one processing core. Right? And the other seven are just going to sit idle and not going to be used. Right, so what you could do is you could basically take your machine and run a couple of virtual machines on it, right, and then each of those virtual machines can run some other applications to actually use more of your machine's physical resources, right? So you can basically make better use of the resources you have available by basically taking your machine and slicing it up into multiple virtual machines, right? So, so let's actually look at a look at a quick example of this. Um, so. On my machine, I have installed this program VMware. So, you know, here I basically have a you know, set of virtual machines that I can run, right? So this, this is my program VMware, which is just a regular application I'm running on my system, right? So if I look in here, you know, there's you know, VMware Fusion, it's just some you know, regular application I'm running. But 
you know, I can say, you know, here I have a, a Windows XP VM. So let's say I can start that virtual machine. Whatever. Um, so see what's going on here is now there's this little process, you know, this extra process that was just created that we can see is using quite a bit of you know memory, and that is actually running this you know virtualized Windows XP, right? So now I essentially just have this window that is running Windows, right? And this is fully fledged Windows, right? This isn't some you know little toy environment. You know, this can actually run you know any Windows applications I want. Well, I was going to, I can't, the interface is cut off, but I was going to just essentially pull up a window showing the system properties where basically it's just going to, you know, it, it essentially thinks that it's running on real hardware, even though it's just running in sort, you know, inside essentially this, you know, virtualized environment. Um, and, you know, I could run, again, you know, I could open up a second VM that's actually running, you know, Linux and be running... Windows and Linux in virtual machines on top of my base machine, which is running Mac OS, right? So again, this is a, you know, this is an example of a type two hypervisor, right? VMware is basically the type two hypervisor running on top of the host OS, which in this case is the Mac OS. And then I can run whatever, you know, virtual machines I want on top of that, you know, type two hypervisor. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, one of the very useful applications for virtual machines is taking a server that potentially has, you know, a lot of resources and basically slicing it up into, you know, multiple virtual machines. And, you know, we can consider an example where that might be something we'd want to do to consolidate resources, right? So say, for example, you have, you know, two physical servers. Maybe you have a server running Windows and a server running Linux, and they're running some applications. And let's say you are upgrading your hardware, right? So you've got a new server that is much more powerful, right? You get new servers that are more powerful than the old ones you had, right? So one thing you could obviously do is just take your applications, you know, your existing, your Windows server and your Linux server and move them to more powerful hardware, right? But what if you don't actually need all of that extra, you know, all those extra resources, right? You don't actually want to sort of just upgrade to better hardware and just have all of the extra resources go to waste, Right, so what we could do instead is take our, you know, take a single new server that has more resources, right, run a virtualization layer on it, and then take our virtual machines and run them both on top of the virtualization layer inside the single physical server. Right, so essentially what we've done there is we have moved from two physical servers to one physical server, Right, handling the same workload, you know, potentially providing the same amount of resources to each virtual machine. Right, so one of the nice things that we can do here is we can basically very flexibly allocate the physical resources of our machines, of our machine, between multiple virtual machines. Right, so again, maybe this new server has eight cores, and we can basically allocate, you know, four cores to each of the two virtual machines. Right, and we can actually uh, just quickly see that I can basically do the same thing here in VMware, right? So this are, you know, these are the, the settings for this particular virtual machine. And I can basically tell it, you know, how many processor cores do I want to give this virtual machine? You know, how much memory do I want to give to it? And obviously, you know, this is basically taking the physical resources of my machine and partitioning them, you know, saying this is the amount I'm going to give to this particular virtual machine. Right, and if we look at actually the memory usage, right, this is the memory usage, again, just from the perspective of the, my Mac, you know, my host operating system, right, this is the process here, which is actually running that Windows virtual machine, right, so that is actually running the Windows VM and whatever processes Windows itself are running, right, we can't obviously see those because those are only processes within the VM itself. Um, right, so, you know, I'm running Google Chrome in Windows here. That's obviously not going to be reflected on, you know, looking at processes on my Mac operating system. 
right? But we can see that, you know, the memory usage that this is using is exactly the amount of physical memory I wanted to give to my VM, right? And so if I have a ton of memory, then obviously I could either give my VMs more memory or, you know, potentially start many more VMs and give them each, you know, some slice of memory. Right, so, you know, the, this consolidation is, you know, a very nice uh, potential use of this. Um, and, you know, in addition to actually just, so was there a question over there? No, okay. Um, in addition to, you know, just splitting up physical resources among virtual machines, right, one very nice thing we can also do is adjust resource allocations on the fly, right? So that's something that's very, very difficult without a virtualized system, right? You can't sort of go in and, you know, add another processor, add another, uh, you know, add some more memory to your machine without, you know, typically shutting your machine down. Right, but with virtualization, right, the resource allocation is sort of all done in software, and so it can be very dynamic as well. So, right, so maybe VM1 in this case actually is using a lot more resources than VM2, so I can essentially just on the fly adjust the resource allocation of VM1. And you don't even necessarily need to fix the allocations, right? So when, we, when I looked at that example of VMware, I was saying, you know, give one gigabyte of my machine's physical memory to the VM, and that's essentially reserved for the VM. But you can also design things so that, right, you just have a global pool of resources, and those can just be, you know, shared between all VMs, right, where you're not actually pre-allocating some fixed set of resources to each VM, right? So you have a lot of flexibility with how you actually want to do your know, resource allocations between VMs. Right, so essentially, you know, this, this approach that I just described, obviously I just showed an example using VMware, but there is essentially a large number of commercial products that are actually providing these kinds of, you know, virtualization systems that are, you know, very much used by, by companies today. So, you know, uh, companies like, you know, Zen and Parallels and VirtualBox, right, these are all actual, you know, uh, software products you can go out and buy or download. You know, some of them are free, some of them are, are, are not. Um, but, you know, these are all essentially doing the same thing. They're giving you, you know, these, these virtualized servers, which are very useful. Um, and just to give us sort of a more, you know, a more concrete example of what we might do with virtualization in a data center, right? So let's say you want to run some database server, right? So, you know, in the conventional case where you're not using virtualization, right, you might just have, you know, some physical server that's running some piece of database software, right? And it's handling some workload, right? People are sending reads and writes to the database, right? And that's essentially all there is to that. But then we move to a data center environment where we have, you know, potentially virtualized servers, right? Let's say we could essentially let a bunch of people run databases each, you know, on shared servers, right? So in this case, maybe we have three physical servers and each physical server is maybe running four virtual machines. And each one of those virtual machines, you know, could be running a you know, database server, and all of them could be handling, you know, independent workloads, right? So from, you know, from an exterior perspective, it almost looks like, you know, we have 12 machines now, even though we only actually have, you know, three physical machines, right? And you could do the same type of thing with pretty much any type of, you know, underlying application. Obviously, there's nothing particularly special about a database. It's just, you know, some, some uh, typical example. Um, so, questions about how virtualization is, is working before I move on? Okay. So, you know, using virtualization in data centers, right, I just gave a minute ago, you know, the example of taking multiple physical servers and consolidating them onto a single physical server using virtual machines, right? So, that's, that's one uh, nice thing we can do with that. Um, also, you know, faster deployment and easier maintenance. Right, so since virtual machines are basically configured in software, right, the tools we have for actually creating and configuring them are typically very straightforward. Right, so for example, in VMware, it's very easy for me to start up a new virtual machine or create a new virtual machine or, you know, change my resource allocations, right? I can do that all in software very, very easily, right, where it's much more difficult if I decide I want a new server if I need someone to go actually go provision a new physical server, right, that's much more difficult than just taking some virtualized server and saying, create me some new VM, 
right? That can, in general, be done in a matter of minutes, and then you have essentially a brand new system that you can use, right? So that's that's very convenient. Um, another technique that is often used in virtualized data centers is virtual desktops, right? So typically, what you have on your own machine is right. Your machine is running its own OS, and you're running applications on your OS. But what you can do with something like a virtualized data center is basically say your computer is essentially going to be a very thin client, a very lightweight client that talks to applications actually running in a data center. Right? So the idea here is that you know, rather than you running a web browser on your own machine, maybe what you can do is run the web browser in some virtual machine located in a data center and all your computer is basically going to do is, you know, send basic commands back and forth and essentially, you know, draw the user interface of your web browser, right? But the actual execution of the web browser itself is all going to be going on inside the data center, right? And your computer essentially has much less to do. It's essentially, you know, just a, a thin client that is actually talking, you know, over the network to the application actually running inside a data center. So... Anyone have any idea why, why, why might this be something that might be useful to do? What's some scenario in which this, this might be useful? Yeah. Right. So one advantage is that right, the, re the responsibility of your own machine is much less. Right? Your machine can be very lightweight. And so as a result, you know, most of the processing power and everything is located in the data center, you know, in some virtual machine. And so your client becomes much simpler, right? So you could envision maybe running a very resource-intensive application on something like a tablet, right, which doesn't have very much, re very much processing capability, right, because you're essentially just offloading all of the work into a data center, right? So that's, that's one benefit. Um, you know, another benefit is something like pushing updates, right, pushing software updates, right? So, for example, let's say you have some, you know, central, let's say you're running uh, some thin uh, virtual desktops on uh, something like checkout registers in a store, right? And you have a ton of different checkout registers, and they're all providing you some interface where, you know, you're updating inventory, for example. Well, if you suppose push some software update to your you know, inventory software or whatnot, right, if all of your terminals are running the software themselves, then you basically are needing to push out software updates to all of your terminals individually. Right? Where if you have an approach like this, right, again, your client is very simple and is not doing very much, you can essentially just update the software in the one place it's actually running, you know, in the virtual machine inside a data center. And all of your clients essentially don't need to do anything, right? Because they're essentially just talking to the remote application and, and displaying its interface. Yeah. Yeah, so potentially you are using a bunch of virtual machines. Um, but you could also see, you could also potentially have multiple uh, virtual desktop mapped to the same machine. So that's actually another potential benefit, right? So in this example, you know, in this little picture shown here, Right, you might have two machines that are both yours that are virtual desktops for the same machine in a data center. Right? And the benefit there is that regardless of which terminal you're sitting in front of, you know, your home machine or your work machine, it's going to look like the exact same machine to you because all of the storage, all of the processing is actually happening remotely inside the data center. Right? And the machine you're sitting in front of is simply some thin client. Right? And that could be some client anywhere. Right? That doesn't need to be your machine that has all of your data because that, you know, your data is just sitting remotely in some data center, right? So that's, that's another, another potential benefit. Um, so you know, one example of an actual virtual desktop-like product is, um, is OnLive. So have any of you heard of OnLive? Basically, it's this uh, service that is designed to let you play games using this approach. So the idea is that OnLive is running a bunch of servers located in data centers, and their servers are actually running the games, right? And games are one of the most processing-intensive applications out there, right? Games are one of the, one of the drivers in, in many cases of more and more powerful hardware is that we have fancier and fancier games that are you know, more, more uh, difficult to run. So OnLive is basically doing all the processing remotely, 
and the client software that you're running is basically just a, you know, it's a thin virtual desktop that's essentially just doing the end displaying and is not doing any of the heavy lifting underneath. Right, and so on live lets you do something like play these intensive games on something like a tablet, which has very few resources, right? So exactly the kinds of benefits we're talking about is, you know, that's essentially the business model of OnLive is they're providing these remote resources. You're basically paying OnLive some subscription fee in order to use their remote resources. And then you can just run the, you know, client software on any type of device you have, even if it's a, you know, very low power, you know, small low power device. So, you know, virtualization is a very flexible and nice idea, um, but there are a lot of administrative and resource management challenges we have to consider when actually using it, right? So a lot of the things I talked about, in order to actually use them, you need to answer some other questions. Like, for example, you know, if I say, you know, give me a new virtual machine, you know, allocate me a new virtual machine, right, you need to decide how many resources do you actually want to give to that virtual machine. Right, and that question may not be easy to answer. Right, you may have a very large server with a lot of resources and 10 virtual machines you want to pack on it. Right, it's a question of how do you actually want to divide up those resources. Right, or in a data center environment, right, you're typically going to have thousands of machines. And so it's obviously a non-trivial problem to figure out, you know, I may have 1,000 physical servers and 5,000 virtual machines that I want to be running on those physical servers. Right, how do I actually want to go and place all of those virtual machines on my physical servers? Right, because what we do want to do is we want to make good use of our resources. Right, if, we, if a virtual machine is only using a little bit of resources, we don't want to be just using an entire physical machine to run that one VM because that would be wasting a lot of resources. But we also don't want to you know, pack 300 virtual machines onto one physical server if that physical server cannot actually handle that total load. Right, so there's a, you know, there's a balance between making good use of the resources we have, but still getting high performance. Right, and that's essentially this trade-off here of high performance and low cost. Right, because you'll get the lowest cost by using the fewest physical resources. Right, the cheapest thing to do is to run one physical server, virtualize it, and run every single thing that you have on that one physical server. And you could, in theory, do that. Right, there's no theoretical limitation to the number of virtual machines you could run on one server. But obviously, after a certain point, your physical resources are not sufficient, and so you actually need more physical resources in order to still get good performance. And you know, another, another issue that I already mentioned about data centers is you know, the, the issue of energy efficiency. Right? So data centers use a ton of electricity, and so you know, making more energy efficient data centers is also, is also a challenge that, that people are very interested in. And so, you know, for example, I mentioned, you know, one of the ways in which some data centers do that, you know, something like the NGHPCC uses exterior air in favor of air conditioning whenever possible in an attempt to, you know, be, be more energy efficient. So, you know, just to give you a, a sense, a picture of the typical costs of running a data center in terms of power, um, so this pie chart here actually shows the typical costs for providing all of the, uh, for actually operating a data center, right? And so, you know, roughly half, a little bit more than half, goes to operating the actual servers themselves, right, to paying for all of the equipment and everything. Uh, but then, you know, almost half of it is essentially going to other factors, right, largely to power and cooling, right? So, you know, power and cooling infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure itself is about a quarter, and, you know, the power usage on top of that is, is about another quarter, right? So, you know, because that this is such, you know, because the role of power is so important in data centers, um, companies like Google have actually taken steps to, you know, cut down on the amount of uh, money being spent on power and cooling. Um, and a few ways they do this are, um, one thing that companies like Google often do is they build things like solar farms to run their data centers off of. Right, so you hear about this quite a bit. You've, I'm sure some of you have. Companies like Google and Facebook are basically going out and building these huge solar farms or these huge wind farms. And the reason they're doing that is to get a lot of power that's not, you know, they're not buying that power from the grid. They're providing their own power in order to run their data centers. Right, because that's obviously going to decrease their costs if they're not having to, you know, buy as much power from the electric grid. 
Um, and then, you know, techniques like pumping external air are also going to, you know, reduce the amount of electricity you're actually using. So that's, you know, also going to cut down on your costs. So, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we've talked about, you know, there are a lot of associated costs with running a data center, um, but a very important factor that is what makes data centers so attractive is this idea of achieving economies of scale, right? So the basic idea here is that when you are managing huge amounts of equipment, it's generally cheaper to do that all in, you know, one huge data center as opposed to having to manage all of that equipment individually. Right, so to give a simple concrete example, in general it's going to be cheaper to operate one data center that has 10,000 machines than it is to operate, you know, 100 data centers that each have 100 machines. Right, because as you throw more and more sort of equipment into one space, right, you're buying equipment in bulk, right, so it's in general going to be less expensive to actually purchase the equipment. Right, you're typically going to be able to get better energy rates when you are essentially buying huge amounts of it at once. And right, it's going to be easier to manage servers when you essentially have all of them running sort of on, under, you know, under one, in one building that are typically largely managed automatically. Um, so you know, if you have 10,000 machines all in one building right, versus one machine in 10,000 different buildings that are each managed by their own, you know, system administrator, obviously you're going to also, you know, save a lot on, you know, management and human costs when you have a small number of people managing a huge data center as opposed to, you know, a ton of different companies that each have their own, you know, server infrastructure and their own IT staff and everything, right? That's typically going to be more expensive. Um, so, you know, in general, the trend is towards building these really, really huge data centers to, you know, achieve these economies of scale. Because in general, as you throw more and more equipment into a single data center, you know, the per unit price, right, the effective price that's being paid, you know, per server is typically going down as you're adding more and more machines, right? So that's why, you know, nowadays we are increasingly seeing these really, really massive data centers, which are what, you know, the big companies like Google and Facebook and Apple are all building. And this, you know, this trend towards really massive data centers um, has resulted in the popularity of, of cloud computing, right? And cloud computing, let's, well, let's, let's talk about what cloud computing actually is, right? So cloud computing is a term I'm sure that all of you have heard because it's sort of a very popular buzzword. Um, but, you know, it's a good question to ask is what does cloud computing actually mean? You know, what is the cloud? Right, so it's a term that's been used in many contexts and applied to lots of different types of applications. Right, so here are all a bunch of different applications that all in some way you could basically say these are all sort of running in the cloud. Um, but essentially when we're talking about the cloud, there's essentially a main couple of common characteristics that determine what we mean when we're talking about the cloud. So, you know, one important characteristic is that in general we're talking about services that are remotely available. Right, when we're talking about something running in the cloud, it's not something running on your own local server, right? It's something that's being provided to you remotely, typically in a data center environment, right? So when you run any cloud application, that's actually being serviced by some machine sitting in a data center rather than, you know, some local machine. Um, another important uh, property is this idea of pay-as-you-go, right? So the idea is that rather than buying hardware to actually run your, run, your, run your applications, right? The idea in the cloud is that you're basically leasing hardware and potentially leasing software that's operating in a data center, and you're just paying for what you use, right? So a typical way to think of this, this is, this is actually the way many uh, cloud platforms operate, is you basically say, you know, I want to rent a server for an hour, and that will cost you some amount. You know, maybe it costs you five cents to rent one server for an hour, right? And obviously then you can rent servers for a much longer period of time. And if you want more than one server, you just rent more servers, right? So you basically say, These are, this is the amount of resources I want. These are the resources I want to have. The cloud provider gives them to you and you basically are just paying for what you're actually using, right? And this is much different from a non-cloud approach where you, know, you need some application, so you need to run some server, so you go out and buy, you, know, you go and buy server hardware, and you obviously pay the upfront cost for buying the hardware, and you pay the continuing cost for actually operating it. 
right? But what you're paying at that point is essentially not necessarily related to what you're actually using. Right? Even if your machine is sitting there idle, right, you still already paid to buy it. You're still paying for you know, the upkeep to actually use it. Right? You're still paying for system administrators, electricity, and all of those factors, even if you're not using those resources. Right? So the idea in the cloud is that you're only paying for the resources you actually need. And if you need a lot of resources, you obviously will pay more, but you can still get those resources. If you don't need as many, you obviously will be able to get fewer and, and pay a lot less you know, as well. Um, so that's another you know, important factor. Um, another one is high scalability. So, right, so one important aspect of the cloud is that we want to be able to quickly add or reduce capacity. So typically all cloud applications allow you to do that. You know, quickly basically scale up or scale down the resources that are provided to you. Right, so if you consider again a non, you know, a conventional case where you have a set of servers that, you know, your organization owns. Right, if you need to go and add a server, right, you need to actually go buy a physical server and go set it up in a server room and configure it and, you know, there's a lot more overhead associated with that. Versus in a data center environment, Right, you basically just say, give me a new virtual machine. That can be provisioned for you in a matter of minutes. Right, no manual intervention required. That can all be automated. You say, give me you know, 10 more virtual machines, that's fine. Right, so, and you can also, of course, do that in reverse. You can essentially say, I don't need this virtual machine anymore and shut it down. Right, and this is all being performed you know, automatically without any you know, manual intervention. So you can very easily you know, scale your resources up and down in that way. Um, and then finally, you know, all of this is happening on a shared infrastructure, right? Typically a data center, right? So the data center is servicing lots of different clients, running lots of applications, you know, all on the same massive pool of physical servers, right? So this is all happening in a shared infrastructure, right? So these are sort of the main, you know, properties that, you know, uh, characterize what we mean when we're talking about the cloud or cloud computing or, you know, cloud applications. So you know, there's a, a number of different types of cloud services, um, which we can largely categorize into um, three classes. Um, so the first category is what we call you know, a software as a service or a software cloud. Um, and this is basically where there's just software that's actually provided to you operating in the cloud. Right? So for example, something like Gmail is a cloud application. Right? Gmail is running on huge numbers of servers, <coughs> running in data centers all over the place. And right, that the, you know, the Gmail is provided to you as a completed application. And now, obviously, you know, you don't, you know, as a personal consumer, don't pay for Gmail. But you know, there are also you know corporate versions of these types of things where you know uh, uh, companies can essentially pay to set up their own, you know, Google Apps, for example. Um, right. So you know, I think UMass has something like that. Um, and so you know, these are just hosted applications you know, the entire application is actually running inside the cloud, and you are basically just renting access to that software, right? So a lot of different examples of this, you know, Salesforce is an example of essentially a cloud database service, right? So that's essentially Salesforce operates their database service in the cloud, and you basically pay for access to Salesforce, right? And iCloud is another example where, you know, that's you know, Apple's cloud software that does things like managing your data and syncing it between devices, right, that is essentially, you know, off-the-shelf software provided in the cloud that you just use as, you know, as the pre-provided software that they, you know, that they have built. Um, so that's, you know, one category. Um, if we move, you know, down a level, um, we get to what we talk about as a uh, platform as a service. So this is basically where, you know, the actual application is not provided to you, Rather, you're basically given a platform in the cloud in which you can run your own applications. Right? So two examples of this are uh, Google App Engine and Microsoft Azure. So these are basically application development platforms where you can write an application using Google App Engine. It's essentially an API that you can write applications in. And then you can take your application and deploy it to you know, one of Google's data centers. And the platform will automatically manage things like scaling your application up and down as needed. Right? So typically, if you are not using a cloud, and you write your application and you deploy it to some server, and your application becomes overloaded, right? It, you know, you need maybe, maybe you need five servers to handle all of the users using your application. 
right? Then it's essentially up to you to actually go get some more servers, provision them, deploy your application to them, right? A lot of, you know, a lot more steps there. Versus if you're using a platform as a service type cloud, right? Something like Google App Engine, their platform is essentially handling all of that for you, right? You write your application and deploy it to Google App Engine. And if your, user, if your application gets a ton of users, they will automatically scale up the number of servers that are actually running your application. And again, it's still going to be a pay-as-you-go type situation, right? If you write an application that's extremely popular, lots of users, lots of resources being used, then you're going to pay for, you know, more for that. Versus if you have some small application that doesn't have many users, you're going to not pay as much for that, right? But all of this is essentially handled transparently, so that's, you know, very convenient. Um, and then the third type is what we call infrastructure as a service. So this is basically the lowest level where you are essentially renting raw resources from the cloud, right? So in the, you know, you are essentially just saying, give me a blank server, right? And they may give you essentially, you know, you may be given a virtual machine running Linux and there's essentially no other software other than, you know, the base Linux system, right? And then it's essentially left entirely up to you to use that in whatever way you want, right? You can run it, write any kind of an application and run it in, you know, in the machine that you're given. But essentially there's no, you know, extra infrastructure provided to you. You just get the raw resources, you know, either computational resources or storage, right? They might, you could also go and just rent a bunch of storage in the cloud and it's up to you to manage that and do, you know, whatever you want with it, right? So that's, you know, this is essentially the lowest level where you're just directly saying, you know, let, I want to rent five machines. And they give you five machines and you do whatever you want with them. Question? Yeah, yeah. Right, so typically in this scenario, you're not renting physical servers, you're typically renting virtual machines. Right, so you say, give me a server, and they, you know, you know, give me a machine, they give you a virtual machine that is running on some physical server that you typically do not know even what physical server that is. And the physical server that your VM is running on may be shared by VMs that other people are operating. Right, and that's completely transparent to you, right? It looks to you like you have a dedicated server, right? That's your VM, even though the underlying hardware may actually be shared by other VMs. Now, that may not always be the case. Now, maybe, you know, if you say, I need a ton of resources, you know, I need, you know, the resources of 100 powerful servers, then maybe you are just going to get, you know, a single virtual machine that has all of the resources of the machine allocated. Right, that might be the case, but you, in general, you don't have a guarantee that you have been given the entire physical server yourself. Right, in general, in general, it's not really a big deal because you are paying for the resources you need. If you need more resources, you pay for more resources, and you will get those resources sort of regardless of on which physical machines they're actually stored on. Right, because you're still paying for a certain amount of physical resources, and that is essentially what you get. Um, so... You know, that's actually a nice segue into, uh, you know, I can, let's talk a little bit more about a specific example of an infrastructure cloud, um, which is uh, Amazon EC2, you know, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, right? So this is probably the highest profile, one of the highest profile um, infrastructure uh, cloud computing services, um, which I know some of you, some of you are, are somewhat familiar with. Um, so Amazon is actually currently the, the largest cloud provider. Now, I'm sure most of you, you know, think of Amazon as, you know, an online shopping store, right? Because that's obviously how Amazon started. Um, so it's actually just as an interesting aside, you know, the reason that Amazon essentially got into the cloud computing business originally was that, you know, Amazon and stores like Amazon, during the holiday season, that's when everyone is buying things, right? So if you're Amazon and you're running a bunch of servers, to handle, you know, the amount of traffic you have at once, the number of people using your site, right, there's a huge amount more people buying things, you know, in, you know, the first couple of weeks of December versus, you know, some other time during the year when, you know, we think that, you know people are not traditionally buying as many things, right? right? So Amazon's issue was essentially that you, they needed enough hardware to basically run their site reliably at the times when there were the most people using the site, which was typically around holiday periods, right? So they essentially needed enough hardware to service their peak demand, 
right? This is a term that's often used, peak demand, meaning the maximum resources at any time that your application might need. And the, 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 the key point here is that your average demand, right, the average workload placed on your application may be much lower than the peak demand, which may only occur at, you know, small, small time periods. And the rest of the time, right, you have much lower demand, and you basically have all of these physical resources sitting around idle. Right, so Amazon basically found themselves with this problem of, you know, the rest of the year, we have huge numbers of computing resources that are going to waste, essentially. And they essentially asked, what can we do with all these computing resources? Well, we can basically set up a business of selling, renting these resources out to other people. Right, and that's essentially, you know, this was probably 10 years ago when, when EC2 was first being conceived of. But that's essentially how, you know, Amazon got into the cloud computing business. Right, so basic idea in EC2 is, as I mentioned, you know, this is the infrastructure approach where you are just taking physical, re you know, you're taking uh, res physical resources through VMs and you're just renting them out at certain rates. Right, so, you know, this uh, chart here shows typical prices that you'll actually pay for renting a VM. Yes. Well, so, I mean, uh, cloud computing is now a very big part of what Amazon does. So they have been essentially constantly building out. And they have, you know, so they have a ton of cloud computing resources now. So uh, essentially the way it wor is working now is basically that Amazon shopping portal is basically a customer of their cloud computing infrastructure. Right? So the Amazon.com web store is actually running on EC2 and a couple of other associated cloud services they do. But essentially they, you know, took their shopping business and basically said, let's, you know, make a cloud computing business and then the shopping part will just be one of the many applications running on top of our, you know, resource cloud computing infrastructure. Yeah. So, you know, you can basically say, you know, depending on the resource needs of your application, right, you can rent various, various sizes of virtual machines. Right, so Amazon has a couple of different tiers. Um, they used to have only three. There are a bunch more now, which I won't get into. But, you know, if we just say that there are maybe three tiers of virtual machines, you can get either a small, a medium, or a large VM. Right, and each one of them is going to have some amount of CPU resources, right, some provisioning of RAM, and obviously they're going to be priced differently. Right, so you can rent a small VM from EC2, and that's going to charge you roughly, you know, two cents per hour. Right, and then you will pay some extra for, you know, storage and bandwidth. But as you can see from these numbers, you know, they're, they're pretty low, right? Two cents an hour is not, not obviously very much. You know, 10 cents per gigabyte transferred, not very much, right? So you could very easily be renting a machine from Amazon for maybe, you know, 20 to 30 bucks a month, right? That's entirely doable. So not very much investment and you're getting, you know, a machine that you're not having to, you know, deal with keeping the machine running, administering the machine, you know, replacing the machine if there's a hardware failure, right? Amazon is essentially all doing that for you, right? Amazon is handling all of that in their data centers, right? So this is, again, the point here is that, you know, Amazon has so many resources that, you know, this economy of scale is vastly lowering the price to you as the consumer so that you can be paying these relatively modest prices to Amazon and it's saving you money versus having to, you know, deal with your own physical machines. And it's also making Amazon money because obviously they're, you know, operating this as a business. So obviously it's, it's profitable for them as well. Um, and, you know, typically you can create a VM on something like EC2 very quickly. So you can do that typically in maybe two to three minutes, right? So you can essentially just go and run one command that says, give me a new VM of this size. EC2 will set it up and provision it, and within a minute or two, there's essentially a, you know, something like a Linux machine that you can do something like, you can SSH to that VM, and it looks like a brand new machine that's just been provisioned for you, right? So you can do all of this, you know, very, very rapidly, and obviously, you know, Amazon is not, you know, that's all automatic on Amazon's end. They're not having to do anything manually. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, you know, EC2, as I mentioned, is, you know, probably the, the most, the highest profile uh, cloud provider today. Um, and many other high profile applications actually run on EC2. So for example, Netflix, Netflix used to operate their own data center, 
which is essentially what I described earlier, where they had their own big warehouse full of machines that they ran Netflix on. Um, but at some point a few years back, they basically decided to stop running their own data center and just use EC2. Right? So Netflix is actually all running on EC2 machines now. So when you go to Netflix and you're streaming videos, that obviously is going through Netflix, but Netflix itself is being run on EC2 VMs. Now, of course, the downside of that is on the very occasional times, but it still has happened when EC2 goes down, or significant pieces of EC2 goes down, which obviously is rare because these things are designed to be very fault tolerant, but occasionally it has happened. So what often happens is EC2 goes down, and all of a sudden it seems like lots of high-profile websites are not working. Right, and the reason for that is that lots of high-profile websites are all running on EC2 data centers. Right, so now obviously in most cases this is not a problem because EC2 and systems like it are designed to be you know, extremely fault-tolerant. Right, so you know, bottom line here is that you know, what something like EC2 is doing is it's replacing you know, companies using their own you know, local resources by taking those physical resources and essentially moving them into a data center environment. And the idea is that that's going to be better both for the companies and for Amazon. Yes? So a, a hypervisor is only on a single machine, right? So Amazon has huge numbers of physical machines, and each one of those physical machines is operating a hypervisor. And so then each one of those physical machines can be running some set of virtual machines on top of it. Right, but yeah, the hypervisor itself is basically managing a single, you know, physical piece of hardware. Um, and now, you know, just to quickly give an example of another type of cloud, right, so that was sort of an infrastructure cloud. Um, now we can also consider, you know, a platform as a service cloud, which as I mentioned earlier is something like Google App Engine. Right, so the idea here is that, you know, Google App Engine is not giving you just sort of a blank machine that you can do whatever with. It's basically providing you an API that you can still write your own program in it, but you have to write it using one of the provided APIs. So currently, Google basically gives you either a Java API or a Python API, so you're essentially restricted your, to writing your programs in one of those languages. Uh, but then, you know, you write your program using that API, you deploy it to App Engine, and, you know, it essentially handles everything else about managing how many servers your application is going to be able to use. Right? And uh, Google App Engine is actually not using virtualization. Um, the idea is pretty straightforward. It's basically monitoring how many requests your application has. And as your application gets more requests, it basically is creating more threads to handle the requests coming to your application. And of course, you know, as needed, it will also basically deploy your application to more physical servers as, you know, as, as needed. Right, but obviously your, you know, your single application doesn't need, you know, a pile of different uh, virtual machines. You know, it's all, you know, running in one environment. So, so we don't actually uh, use virtualization for Google App Engine. Um, but, you know, same, same essential basic idea. You know, Google App Engine is handling the scalability things for you, which if you're just renting machines, you know, directly using EC2, Right, it still is easy to do things like provision new machines and shut them down, but it's still you know, left up to you to do that manually if you're just doing that at the low level of saying, you know, give me three machines. Versus App Engine, you don't have to worry about any of those details. So you are restricted to using the API, um, but then you, know, you, you get all the benefits of not having to deal with scalability yourself. Um, and you know, another, another important... Uh, aspect is the, the idea of public versus private clouds, right? So everything I've talked about before, we've essentially been talking about public clouds, right? Where these resources are available to anyone who wants to pay the money to actually rent the servers, right? So if you want, if you, you know, you as a regular, you know, uh, basically anyone off the street can go and say, I want an Amazon EC2 VM, and they will give you one, right? And you pay Amazon some money and you have, you know, those resources to use. Um, but, you know, this is often not, a, not acceptable for companies which have things like sensitive data and essentially don't want to be taking their data and storing it in a public cloud, right? Because in a public cloud, you are basically entrusting the operator of the cloud to actually manage your data for you, right? And so if there is, you know, a security breach on EC2, for example, right, if EC2 has their data center compromised, 
right, then if you are a company, you essentially are vulnerable to any you know, vulnerability in the data center itself. Right, so companies often don't want to just use public clouds. So many companies actually will set up private clouds, which are essentially the same idea, but you know, local to a single organization typically. Right, so you might have some large company that sets up a private cloud and you know, the different organizations, you know, the different departments within the company, for example, may say, you know, I need some machines, so I will get them from the private cloud. You know, rather than you know, saying, you know, go email IT and have them go set you up a physical server, you basically just you know, run some commands saying, give me some resources from the private cloud. Right? So there, obviously, it's a little bit different in that typically you're not going to be you know, paying for some resources. You basically just have you know, a large pool of resources available to your organization that you know, all of the various parts of the organization can, can use. Um, but then we you know, can also have essentially a hybrid model between these two where you know, typically an organization does have some of their own resources. Right? You're going to have some set of your own servers that you use to run your applications. Right? And you've already paid for those. Right? So let's say you're, an you're, you're a company that wants to make use of a public cloud. Right? You want to be able to get the benefits of paying for resources only when you need them, for instance. Right? Remember, that was one of the, the main benefits. But you still have a bunch of resources that are yours that you've already paid for, right? So you still want to be able to use those resources. So the idea of a hybrid cloud is basically that you will run your applications on your local resources, but when you actually need extra resources, you're basically going to supplement with things that you with resources that you rent from the cloud, right? So maybe maybe during a typical time. You have enough private, you know, you have enough private resources to meet your application demands. But maybe during peak periods where you have a lot of users, maybe you don't have enough, you know, uh, resources. So you could just go out and buy more physical servers, but we already described that if they're going to be sitting idle most of the time, that's not ideal. So what you can do instead is, you know, go to something like EC2 and temporarily rent some VMs to run to supplement your own local resources. Right, so this is this is essentially the idea of a hybrid model where you have you know both sort of the private your know, private resources supplemented with local resources that you are just basically renting on demand whenever you need them. Um, so uh, I think we're out of time, so I'll stop there. We have a little bit more on cloud computing um, to cover next time.